Welcome back to the Junior Small Fee Channel. As you all are very much aware, the price of silver, how it's determined, as well as that of gold, can be controversial sometimes. And one of the things that comes up is production costs. You'll hear that mentioned a lot. So today I was reading some articles and that was just a question I had. It just popped into my head out of nowhere once again. You know, hey, what's the production cost currently of silver? What are people saying about it? And I started just digging in a little bit uh, into the more recent, like last two years, two years history, pulled up some reports from several different mines, and I kind of narrowed my search down on one big uh, paper, and we're going to get to that PDF file here in a moment. But I'll kind of walk you through just the summary of the brief journey I went on the last two days in reading about this and kind of looking into it. So I started off just seeing some headlines you know about silver prices being range bound as the dollar stabilizes expect silver prices to trade sideways you know really not going anywhere uh, silver prices range bound as dollar stabilizes and I understand this is controversial some people you know myself included I don't take all of this a hundred percent literal and I'm not gonna say that what these articles are predicting is 100% accurate and the way it's going to be but I'm gonna just look at you know where are they coming from how did they get to this uh, opinion so silver prices rose slightly on Thursday. May silver futures edged up five cents or 0.3 percent to about 17.63 an ounce, and they're talking about silver prices to trade sideways. Again, that is their outlook for the near term here. So I began looking into silver production. I started around 2015, just looking at some of that, and here's uh, some stuff that I found. Global silver mine production growth slowed to two percent in 2015 and reached a record. 886.7 million ounces. The mine production growth was attributable to stronger output in Peru, Argentina, Russia, and India, while Canada, Australia, and China had lower mine production, with the latter decreasing output by 3%. Primary silver mine production grew 5% and accounted for 30% of global silver mine supply. The overall slowdown in mine production last year is expected to continue. So here we're going to get into the costs. Primary silver co-product cash costs plus CapEx fell by 11% to U.S. 1174 per ounce. This drop was driven by weaker local currencies, aggressively lower CapEx, and lower fuel prices. Again, as with gold, fuel and oil, specifically diesel to operate heavy machinery, is uh, directly tied to the extraction and production costs of these precious metals. So with the lower cost in the fuels, it would make sense that the production costs dropped. Here's a look at the top 20 silver producing countries, long list of them there. If you want to pause it, you can read through them, see what their productions were, and uh, you can see Mexico at the very top there in Peru leading the pack as far as output in millions of ounces of silver. And here are the top 20 silver producing companies and here is the leading primary silver mines uh, I actually know someone very closely that worked at number eight there the Greens Creek mine I believe that's in Alaska it's run by Hecla mining company and you can see that's uh, the mine productions there how many millions of ounces in 2014 and 2015 those various mines produced let's start working our way towards the production cost of silver the, the process of determining silver's production cost differs from other metals Two-thirds of world silver production is a byproduct of other metal mines. This means cost cannot be determined as an all-in-one process, but rather on a cash revenue basis. The World Gold Council forecasts for 2016, according to gold mining byproduct standards, label production costs of silver at around $12 to $13 per ounce. World Silver Production a fact that is often overlooked is the fact that mine types are not derived from tonnage, but rather by the greatest revenue source. For example, say there's an operation that mines copper and also gold. The quantity of copper may be double that of gold, yet the gold produces 95% of the mine's revenues. Gold and other precious metals have much higher prices in comparison to more common metals like copper. But they have significantly higher process than silver too. Considering this fact, there are very few primarily silver mines compared to gold mines because the high prices of gold. 
This leads to two-thirds of the world's silver being considered a byproduct of alternately classified mines. World silver production increased by 2.1% in 2015, according to the chart below. Cash costs are the acid test measure of what silver price the miners need to break even and cover their ongoing cash operating expenses. These include all direct production costs, mine level administration, smelting, refining, transport, regulatory, royalty, and tax expenses. Silver miners can survive as long as silver prices remain above their cash costs. And in quarter one 2016, average cash costs fell 10.3% to just $5.99 per ounce. A big factor in this was the surging gold prices, which resulted in higher byproduct credits to offset silver mining expenses. It's pretty impressive to see cash costs drop so dramatically in a quarter where silver's average price edged just 0.9% higher to $14.90. As long as silver remains above $6 an ounce, which is impossibly low given its fundamentals today, any talk of silver miners not being able to survive is foolish. But cash costs are misleading, as it takes far more expenditures to run a silver mining company as a going concern. All that silver mined is constantly depleting deposits, so now new ones have to be found and developed to maintain production levels and old exhausted mines have to be reclaimed. So in June 2013, the World Gold Council released the far superior all-in sustaining cost metric to measure mining costs. All-in sustaining costs include everything necessary to maintain and replenish silver mining operations at current production levels. This includes all direct cash costs of mining silver along with all corporate level administration that always should have been included in cash costs. But AISC go far beyond that to encompass the entire mining cycle, making them a far more realistic representation of true silver mining costs. They also include exploration for new silver to mine, the enormous mine development and construction expenses necessary to bring new mines online remediation and reclamation. As long as prevailing silver prices remain above all in sustaining costs, silver miners can continue to produce at current levels indefinitely. And rather impressively, they plunged dramatically in quarter one 2016 among the elite SIL silver miners. Their average AISC, again, all in sustaining costs of just $10.28 per ounce were 21.8% lower than quarter four in 2015, $13.14. That's amazing, leading to soaring operating profits for these elite silver miners in quarter one 2016. In the fourth quarter, silver's 1477 average less the 1314 AISC average drove silver mining operating margins of just $1.63 per ounce. That's tight, too low for comfort for an industry that has to contend with silver's wild price volatility. So you can see they're all in sustaining costs, you know, everything included, they're saying is, is hovering around that $13.14 an ounce. Moving on, we're going to get a little bit more in depth in this. I found this PDF file from Thomson Reuters called the World Silver Survey. This is a huge file, a lot of pages, a lot of information. I'll throw a link in there if you guys want to read it and digest it yourselves. It's a pretty exhaustive piece of material. And I dug through it and just I brought up multiple slides, multiple things to discuss here that I thought you would find interesting as it relates to the topics at hand. We'll start off here by looking at a couple of different companies that are uh, that are well known to us all. Pan American Silver Corp, if I remember correctly, they are PAAS if you type in their ticker on a financial site. Pan American Silver Mining Company was founded in 94. What I want to get down to here is their costs, however. So our team of industry leading professionals has proven experience in exploration, project development, operations, and finance. In 2015, we produced a record 
26.12 million ounces of silver and 183,700 ounces of gold at cash costs of, so these are their cash costs, uh, 970 per ounce of silver and an all-in sustaining cost per ounce sold of 1492 so I would say that's the most accurate reflection of the price that they have invested to get that silver out of the ground so again that's in 2015 we were looking at for Pan American silver let's just call it 1492 that's uh, easy to remember that's the year Columbus sailed across the uh, ocean blue in 2016 we expect to produce 24 to 25 million ounces of silver and 175,000 to 185,000 ounces of gold at a cash cost of 945 to 1045 per ounce of silver and an all-in sustaining cost per ounce sold of 1360 to 1490. So it's hanging right around that, that almost $15 an ounce to get this stuff out of the ground. In addition, we plan to spend between 65 and 75 million dollars in sustaining capital and between 135 and 140 million in expansion projects, mainly at La Colorada and Dolores. So it's really not that far off from in you know several years ago uh, when fuel prices were much higher than they are now. I was hearing about some of these costs of extracting silver at all in sustaining costs and such. Uh, of almost around that 20 to 21 dollar an ounce mark. So if fuel prices have collapsed a little bit, and uh, we're seeing some changes in other areas where the you know currency strength, perhaps these companies are only spending 14.90 to extract silver out of the ground right now. Now again, this is for large deliveries of you know raw silver product, which is not what we're buying it in in these you know rough loaf bars and poured bars that, that leave the way it leaves some of these uh, facilities having it reduced in size uh, purified and then put into plankets to be struck into coinage there's a signature charge call that uh, two to three dollars an ounce and you know you you almost see where we're at with silver today so silver prices right now when you get it in the form of a silver coin uh, I would say are fair in relation if anything, on sale and a very good deal compared to what they are doing to get it to that state to where it can be delivered to you struck in the form of a kookaburra, a U.S. silver eagle, a Canadian maple leaf, a philharmonic, or any such struck coin. Looking at Silver Wheaton Corp, another famous silver producing company, they are claiming that other than the initial upfront payment, the company typically has no ongoing capital or exploration costs. Furthermore, operating costs have been historically fixed at around $4 per ounce of silver produced and $400 per ounce of gold produced subject to inflationary adjustments. They don't mention in there very much. They're all in sustaining costs per ounce sold or other um, costs. So, you know, again, these are statements that are most likely released by these companies and it, they're going to try to paint themselves in a profitable light because they are dependent upon stocks sold and investors in their company and their stock price and making boards of people happy and such so they might be painting themselves in a little bit healthier light sometimes than is truly accurate and moving onward, we've got the top 20 silver producing countries there on the left, and we've got the top 20 silver producing companies there on the right. Again, 20. this is from uh, 2014 and 15 dates, and we're seeing so the, the top 20 silver producing countries and top 20 companies. Now here we can see silver mine production winners and losers, 2015 versus 2014. So you can see the millions of ounces there. Millions of ounces and tonnage is the uh, on the right. You can see where the color is green would be uh, the darkest green, over 5 million ounces or 156 tons. And then you can see uh, the numbers diminish there to where there was actually a reduction in production. When you get to the, about that grayish color there, you're starting to see a decrease in silver mine production. Looks like Russia had a, an increase in their silver production as well as Mexico, Argentina, and Peru, and other regions in South America. Even India 
having a, a an increase in production there as well as Sweden. North America, North American mine production fell for the first time in seven years, dropping by three million ounces, 93 tons, to total 237 million ounces, or 7,374 tons. This outcome was driven by a drop in the lead zinc sector in Mexico and Canada, partially offset by an overall increase in production from primary silver mines. And again, the main reason that I got into these articles was production costs for silver. And it's saying production costs for silver producers fell again in 2015. On a co-product basis, the average cash cost plus capex decreased by 11% to 11.74 per ounce. By comparison, the total cash cost on a byproduct basis averaged $6.66 per ounce in 2015, a 3% year-on-year decrease. The silver producer hedge book expanded by 7.8 million ounces or 244 tons in 2015, ending the year at a delta adjusted total of 38.9 million ounces. The United States also experienced a reduction in silver output of 7% year on year to total 35.4 million ounces. The largest change year on year was registered at Bingham Canyon where lower grades and reduced throughout due to the de-weighting and dewatering led to a 1.5 million ounce drop in output. We estimate that production at Tex Red Dog dropped by approximately 0.5 million ounces. The gold sector posted a loss of 1.9 million ounces, which stemmed from the suspension of operations at Highcroft mid-year. Gains were noted in the primary silver sector, with an increase at Greens Creek on higher grades, albeit partially offset by a drop at Lucky Friday, again another mine, due to a failure in the underground ventilation system. European silver production increased by 9.1 million ounces, the growth was driven by a 14% increase in output from Russia's largest primary silver mine, Dukat, which increased silver production by 2.4 million ounces, thanks to an increase in ore processing rate and silver grade, both up by 13% year on year. Russia's total mine output rose to 50.5 million ounces, fifth consecutive annual rise, and the highest level of output for over 20 years. Swedish silver mine output increased by 3.1 million ounces, or 25% to a total of 15.9 million ounces, the sixth largest annual increase at a country level. This gain can largely be attributed to an expansion at Garpenberg. African mine supply rose slightly to 6% year on year to 14.8 million ounces. Moroccan output recorded an 8% gain. Let's continue looking at production costs. On a co-product basis, cash costs with capex of, for 2015 average 11.74. An ounce and 11% drop relative to 2014. Here's a chart that kind of breaks down and looks at silver mine production costs for 2012, 2013, 2014. So you can just see it there. The average silver price is down on the bottom there. You can see the uh, TCC byproduct, co-product, co-product, and capex. And here's an interesting chart. It shows silver mining costs. You can see there, and you've got two bars up on top. The average silver price in 2015 of 1568 and then the 2014 average silver price of $19 an ounce. There's a lot more material in this report uh, covering everything from the, the scrap production of silver and the amount of scrap that's available as well as uh, I looked at some silver bullion trade and this is I want to show you guys as well the silver bullion trade here that we're looking at. You've got silver bullion trade in 2015 continued to be dominated by flows to India where total imports reached an all-time high of 256 million ounces. Uh, the US bullion imports reached a record high last year reflecting the strong increase in retail investment as well as recovery in flows from Latin America due to increased mine production. Switzerland continued to lose out in its importance as the Global Silver Trading Center last year, recording another year of trading deficits, many exporters redirected their silver shipments to other countries instead. Silver bullion imports to China increased significantly in 2015, especially the second half of the year. While the country's industrial segment remained soft, the depreciation of the yuan in August provided arbitrage trading opportunities. There's some pretty cool maps of these trades. Uh, coming up in just a second here, though, let's look again at the Americas. The Amer United States imported a record 223 million ounces of silver and ore in 2015, a 22% increase over the previous year. 
This double digit rise follows a 4% contraction in 2014. The increase was driven by recovery in flows from Latin America and Canada. But let's move on here. Let's check this out here. Major trade flows in silver bullion to the United States. This is again two years ago, 2015. There you can see the amounts in millions of ounces. And uh, you can see the trade flows and volumes moving. So you got Belgium, Poland, Germany, Guatemala, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Mexico, Canada, South Korea. And then it just shows you all the different millions of ounces that are moving towards the United States. Uh, here's another one of major trade flows in silver bullion from Hong Kong. So this is silver leaving Hong Kong being traded to other regions. You can see it going to Nepal, India, Thailand, Australia, China, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Canada. So there you can see silver moving from Hong Kong out. And then uh, this one here, major trade flows in bullion from South Korea. Again, moving to China, to India, to Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Malaysia. Again, these are in millions of ounces. Definitely an interesting look at uh, silver prices uh, just in the last two years, production prices, where, where silver is moving, silver production. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, unique and interesting look, uh, joining me in exploring just this one PDF document and some of the stories that we covered here on silver production costs, where silver bullion is moving. It's kind of a neat little look into the whole world uh, of silver. And it's one of those things when I'm actually holding an ounce of silver, I feel like somehow I am part of this this document, part of this entire industry, this this global movement in commodity exchange. And uh, it's, it's neat to be a part of it. Whether you are holding one gram of silver or 10,000 ounces, you are tied to this somehow and uh, I know that some of you might not fully agree with the numbers you saw here today I myself might have my own personal opinions on what these numbers mean and what's accurate and what's not and it's difficult for us to actually nail down what the true you know all-in costs of producing and selling an ounce of silver might be and I don't think we'll ever accurately know depending on where we are in the world. Labor costs are different in different parts of the world. Fuel costs, taxes, uh, again, mine remediation. We have the EPA here in the United States. It's, it's, it's most likely much different to have to remediate and uh, heal a mountain after mining it in like the state of Colorado than it would be, let's say, in a mountain somewhere in China. There's just different environmental remediation costs and, of course, different labor costs. We have... Um, stronger unions here in the United States, you have a different currency, different labor laws, and therefore different costs to put human effort at work in extracting and producing silver. So it's different all around the world. And uh, somehow the free market has to digest all of these different facts, all of the different variables that plug into that coin. So take out a silver coin. I'm doing it right now. I'm looking at one of the the multi rounds, the one that lives in my wallet, and I have to realize that silver come from, came from some place. And all of the variables that we just discussed, just a fraction of them, there's so much more in this article. It's unbelievable. It's very long and lengthy uh, piece of material. But all of the different uh, facets of information that are contained in that document, all of it has to be jumbled up, balanced out, thought about, calculated. And then when you're looking at that coin, look at it, the one in your hand, that's how that, the price and the valuation of that, that metal, that weight of metal in your hand is determined by all of that, all that information that's out there. And just think of the human effort, the labor, uh, just what we co covered here, uh, you know, mine exploration, um, ha having to just, I, I've seen mines go in, in different parts of the mountain states that I've explored. I've, I've driven by places that were under production for over a decade just to get to the point where they could go in there and start getting metal out. You know, they had to set up, um, dig, and establish all of their different water protection mechanisms and, and install air handling systems and just to get prepared to extract metal out of the earth in that, at that location. So it's pretty interesting. Um, well, there you go. We looked at... Uh, silver at a little more in-depth look today on what silver production costs might be and looks like 1492 is a pretty good number right now 15 bucks an ounce we'll call it and uh, you know you throw a couple bucks in there for 
the assay charge and to make a planket out of it and have it struck, well, then you're looking at you know, 18, 19, 20 dollars an ounce and you start to realize we're pretty darn close to the production cost of raw ore if you get a big bar. I don't know how many of you actually go out and buy you know, small or large Comex contracts for 1,000 or 5,000 ounces and have large, big poured bars like that in your uh, house. But uh, if you did, you might be able to get it for closer to that spot price or that production price. All right, have a good day. Thanks for stopping by, visiting the Junius Malpe channel. Hope you enjoyed this installment, this video, this discussion. Go ahead and smash the thumbs up button. If you're not subscribed to do so, please, and uh, always share the videos that you enjoy and explore the archives of this channel. And I look forward to, in a couple of days, hooking up, hopefully, with Salivate Metal on a live broadcast. We'll see if we can uh, arrange that and schedule that appropriately. So tune in for that. I believe that's tomorrow evening. Thanks for being here. As always, keep stacking.